Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Should I exit for the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Should I exit for the moment? Yeah. Oh, I can hear myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Should I exit for a moment? Oh, okay. I can hear myself. So, all right. So <laughs> let, let so I'm going to act as moderator. Um, today. Um, so I'm going to say uh, welcome so, everybody right. so, um, let, let, joining so another um, ACE um, Lunch today. and Learn session. Um, so um, say, uh, I'll hand it over uh, to Shandu um, to take on the presentation. Hi everybody. Thank you for joining me for this Lunch and Learn. Today we're going to cover a paper on the subject of text summarization. On the subject. Uh, this particular paper was published in 2018 uh, from a group of researchers um, at Microsoft Research Cambridge. Um, it's because it's published in the last year, so some of the comparisons may not be most up to date, but may still uh, for date, from my perspective, still, it has been a very informative process of going through the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts. Uh, so I hope you will, we will all enjoy it. Uh, so I hope uh, here we go. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to add um, yeah. that Sarush also um, is acting as a facilitator um, ah, right. and an expert of the discussion. So mm -hmm. um, feel free to jump in if you'd like to clarify anything, Sarush. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. Shan will be uh, probably using your help along along the road as well. Yes. Um, yeah. You're glad to be here and glad to help. Thank you. Well, enjoy yes. it. Yeah, many thanks to um, my two facilitators as well. They will help me throughout this uh, one hour presentation. Yes. Okay. And go back to the title. The title of the paper is Structured Neural Summarization and Highlight Being Structured. What does it mean? For this particular paper, it's about using graph to augment a sequence-to-sequence -sequence text summarization. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to cover some of the general background so that the later comparisons will make more sense to everybody, regardless you're an expert in NLP or not. But we will spend most of the time in the actual content, what's new for this paper. Um, like I said at the very beginning, the focus, of the goal of the paper is to carry out the so-called abstractive text summarization. So there are two main flavors of text summarizer. One is uh, called extractive. Think about it as a highlighter. Um, Imagine you're given a, a, a couple of newspaper article and you're asked to write a summary, summary for them. You have two choices. One is in the extractive way. You have a highlighter in your hand. You highlight some of the key phrases and you figure out how do I arrange them in the reasonable order so that in the end you get the summary. Versus abstractive will require some more creative thinking uh, on, on our end. Um, now now we are handed over with a pen and we are required to ask, uh, we're required to write something with novelty, but concise and carry the main meaning of the text at the same time. So two uh, representative examples for these two flavors of summarization will be for extractive, thinking about it as if you're writing a relatively dry summary for some technical text or a uh, factual text, for example, newspaper articles, versus for abstractive ones, one great example of you writing a synopsis for novels. And that's the background. And for this paper, we're focusing on abstractive, which is more challenging because instead of just the copy and paste, we really need to have a language model that understands what's going on uh, in our input. And um, there are many, um, different ways of doing this. Um, and for this paper, the mo most, the majority of the comparison is done with a uh, recurrent neural network. Uh, so we have many different flavors of neural network, um, but if we are to do comparisons, the closest um, analogy to uh, recurrent neural network will be convolutional neural network. CNN has been widely used for image processing and versus RNN usually 
we use the four sequence analysis that will be time series like stock price and also for text summarization and machine translation. So the, the uh, standout difference for those two types of neural network will be they both allow some form of locality for CNN allows spatial locality. So a cat that presenting any locations in an image will always be a cat, no matter if it shows up at lower left corner or upper right corner. Versus for RNN, you can think about think about it in the same way. Oh, uh, the word apple, no matter uh, where it presents in, in text, it should more or less represent the same thing. Um, and recurrent neural network, the word recurrent um, just means instead of um, the network uh, input output flow in one direction, we have a recurrent arrow that goes backwards. So uh, think about the mental imagery we are to have is, for example, in this um, uh, uh, so-called unrolled um, representation of a recurrent neural network. We're processing a sentence that comprise of several words, and we are reading the sentence from left to right. And every time we want to not only uh, focus on what's what the word we're currently reading, we also want to take advantage of the uh, previous words uh, information. So that's the recurrent step in the neural network. Um, so one thing that's um, very special for RNN is just like uh, CNN that shares weights across space, we're now sharing weights across time. Think about time steps or uh, the, as we're going through a sentence. And we can make the network deep by stacking a bunch of the cells together and layer by layer. And there has been uh, some improvements to the cell type itself because one challenge for RNN, if we're just doing it in a very simple form uh, without giving the cell more complex structures inside, we usually suffer from a vanishing gradient problem. Um, and you can think about it as uh, if you are asked to uh, read a text and recall the content a moment later, uh, you might suffer from forgetfulness, right? And the same thing happens to the neural network. So there's some mitigation to how do we help the neural network cells to better remember the long-term information. And the two most popular cell types are shown here, which is LSTM and GRU. Um, they are I would say um, GRU is probably simpler and faster, but they are both frequently used in more modern um, RNN architectures. So there are many different ways uh, of handling um, RNN tasks, and uh, you can see here are some examples. If we don't have a huge amount of delay between our input sequence and output sequence, then that's a uh, almost no delay type of sequence to sequence task that's often used for time series prediction, for example, stock price prediction. And we also have some other tasks that depends on uh, the dimension of the output. For example, if we have a sequence input and we only want a vector output, that would be a good example of that is a sentiment analysis. And then the converse is also true. Imagine we have an image and we want to automatically generate a caption for it. That will be the vector to sequence type of tasks. But for text summarization or machine translation, oftentimes what we're using is a delayed sequence to sequence architecture that we're looking at here. So instead of like the first one that we don't wait, um, um, uh, we, there's almost no delay between input sequence and output sequence. We, we first ingest it, the entire input sequence and uh, have an understanding uh, in near the end of the ingestion, and then we output uh, it, uh, our predictions in the decoding uh, stage. So, and for this paper, the focus will also be this kind of encoder-decoder architecture. And uh, to just um, help everybody have a, um, uh, the same kind of uh, context, um, and also 
Uh, this is related to the intro section of the paper. Uh, we will spend a little bit of time on what's the latest for the sequence model-based um, abstractive summarizer. And then based on this foundation, we will have a better understanding about what's the contribution of this paper in particular. Um, so like what we just talked about, we uh, often use encoder-decoder architecture for summarization tasks. And uh, the encoder has had some improvements and the most standout one will be the uh, a change from unidirectional and RNN cells to bidirectional. We will soon see an example of what that means. And the decoder side, there also has been a lot of progress in recent years, uh, as the bullet points shown here. And at a time of this paper, which is last year, most of the uh, most of the improvements in this architecture, meaning encoder decoder, has been on the decoder side. Um, encoder improvements, this is, uh, seems to be um, somewhat simple, but also elegant and uh, very relevant to how humans actually uh, interpret any text. So traditionally, it, we're, when we're using a unidirectional uh, recurrent neural network, it, it means we are encoding the sequence from left to right only. But imagine us reading any text, especially for summarization text that really require a good understanding. We don't just read the text from one direction. We also glance and both forwards and backwards. So Bidirectional RNNs is based on that idea. We give the uh, neural network a chance not just to uh, read the text from left to right, but also in the reverse direction, and we concatenate the two uh, encoding together, and that gives us a much better encoding. Um, that's problem and solution, very straightforward. And then we also have decoder improvements. Uh, Remember, the uh, encoder-decoder is a delayed sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, and the delay can be a problem. Um, going back to the analogy of us humans being asked to say, oh, I just read to you a bunch of text, and without giving you any kind of uh, chance to recall what, what I just read to you, and I asked you to repeat or summarize the text to me again, then it's natural to forget what you just heard, right? And the same thing can happen to neural network. And if we just use the vanilla form of encoder-decoder architecture, uh, we are cramming the entire sequence to the very last time step, and then we throw this, this context vector, so-called context vector. You, we can view that as a, the understanding of the neural network, a neural network about its input. Through this whole thing at a very last time step to the decoder and hoping that decoder will just figure everything out. But uh, this can become problematic because just like humans will forget and your network will also forget, especially when given long sentences. So one mitigation is to uh, give, give the uh, neural network a chance to glimpse the input uh, during the uh, decoding step. This is a so-called attention mechanism. Uh, we're not only providing the decoder with uh, the last hidden state from the encoding step, we're also keeping track of the output of the encoder from every single intermediate time step. And then we're comparing, okay, at uh, any given time step t, how, how similar is my decoder uh, input uh, compared to the intermediate steps of the encoder? And then based on that similarity, uh, we this the similarity, you can think about it as if we are given a chance to, to revisit uh, what we have been read so far, right? Um, and then that gives us a boost in a decoding step um, so that it's not so much pressure of cramming everything to the very last output, but also having information about the intermediate step um, during the encoding. And this is a... Uh, great improvement for the decoder itself, but it's not a um, the end of story, as we shall soon see. Um, another special guest is uh, self-attention. There has been a lot of advancement uh, in this direction as well, and one special thing about it is 
uh, instead of relying on a sequence-based model, now we are just using attention. Uh, attention, like what we just talked about, it is uh, giving a probability distribution that's based on a similarity between the things we're trying to decode and the context vector that's um, encoding all of the intermediate steps during the encoding stage. So the same kind of philosophy can be used for both the encoding and decoding step. And in the extreme case, which is a transformer network architecture for people who are not familiar with this concept but are curious about learning more, um, please go to ACE uh, website. There's a bunch of uh, videos on the subject, but the gist of it is it, you can view it as a paralleled version of the encoder-decoder architecture. And one plus is um, in extreme situations, we can get, not even use the sequential way of doing encoding and decoding. Instead, we are relying purely on attention to do encoding and decoding. Just want to add very quickly that yeah, sure. um, uh, the the videos um, of we have a series of videos on um, on transformer networks, uh, transformer Excel, which is the latest progression of this work, uh, GPG two um, and BERT. All of them will cover areas of uh, and from within um, transformer network architecture uh, or self attention architecture. And the videos, as um, as uh, Sean mentioned, um, are both on our ACE ACE website. Um, AISC dot uh, A I dot science, or also on our YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. You can you can find and subscribe and and enjoy the content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you find yourself binge watching Self Attention Transformer Network, then I would be very proud of it. Um, okay. Um, Attention has helped a lot to give the encoder-decoder a chance to glimpse back the input, but it's not enough yet. One problem that, that uh, summarizers are often suffering from is, a, uh, is making factual errors. Um, so the cause of this is, for, uh, let me give you guys an example first. So factual error will be, for example, in the sentence here, Germany beat Argentina um, by a score of two, uh, three to two. And this is actually wrong. The correct answer could be two to zero or <laughs> something like that. Uh, the reason behind that is two to three is a rare word. And oftentimes during decoding, we're using uh, the input information that's hard Already been heavily processed through embedding, encoding, and attention mechanisms. Uh, we could have missed essential words that that doesn't have great embedding to start with. So, how do we mitigate that 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 problem? And one way to do this is to directly copy a text from the source. So, it is like giving the abstractive summarization a flair of. Um, extractive summarization, um, but this is really helpful for dealing with rare words that, that are rare but also important. And this is an example. If you can see that compared to pure attention, we now also have access to the source and text, not just the encoded context vector. And by combining the two, we have a final distribution that allow us a chance to not only generate the text from the encoded information, but also, also to copy the source text when necessary. That's, that's one. One issue. The other issue, as um, we will later see. If yeah, I sorry. could add something very quickly, yeah. if you go back to the previous slide. So, sure. um, in, in most of the architectures, um, uh, the pointer generator um, makes a binary decision as to, oh, should I generate at this point, or should I just point to a word? Mm -hmm. um, this also, and and I think that's represented by that um, uh, yellow circle in the middle um, right. that you have. Um, and and you have a probability of pointing or generating. Mm -hmm. um, it, another another point, um, if you haven't said that, um, that mm -hmm. it would help with is that um, oftentimes um, uh, you'd like to generate, um, uh, uh, go from some embeddings to some actual words, uh, but you may not have it in your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, so the the pointing architecture uh, can help you generate things that you um, uh, that you'd like to say. Um, mm -hmm. without without access to the vocabulary. Right. 
Thank That's you. A common problem, actually, and it happens because lots of times there is a new word or concept or name that happens that weren't, weren't available by, while we were doing encoding, and it's good to have it, yeah, I guess. So it's not only limited to 3 by 2 or something like this, I guess. Mm. Right. Thank you, Sean. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. And we have a tension, we have we have pointer generator, but we still have the problem of the decoder repeating itself. And, and sometimes this can be catastrophic. Uh, this is one example right here. Germany, be Germany, be Germany. You just see this repeating pattern goes on and on and on and on. The reason behind this is um, uh, Oftentimes, uh, the encoder-decoder architecture ended up being overly relying on decoder input, and, and then that makes a decoder that's very myopic. There's no self-reflections on, oh, what has been covered so far, so I shouldn't repeat that thing again. The, the, uh, the idea behind coverage is simple but also elegant. It is uh, making a bookkeeping of, oh, how much attention these words have gotten so far. If it has gotten a lot of attention, that means I have already presented in, in my previous decoding step, and then I should not repeat myself. So it applies this penalty mechanism to words that have gotten a lot of attention. So all of these um, improvements in decoding has helped a lot. Uh, let, let us um, repeat that again. Attention, pointer, generator mechanisms, and also coverage. So for this paper, instead of focusing on the decoder, uh, what the authors want to do is to have a encoder that's not just the processing of lower level words, but also are aware of the higher level structure that involves using graph. And in this next section, we're going to look at why using graph and how exactly is a graph being used in this paper. OK, and go back to the beginning of the beginning. Even after all these advancements, uh, we still find our neural network having a hard time handling long text and can be easily distracted by simple noise. Um, this paper's solution is to focus on encoder and uh, we still keep the C, uh, sequence model and part of the encoder, but give it an augmentation using graph annotation. This it makes intuitive sense in a way that for humans, when we read text and try to make summarization, is uh, we will have an easier time not just to have uh, fine granularity uh, interpretation, but also, for example, make an outline and have really the structural view, right? So this this is a basic idea uh, of having a sequence graph hybrid. Um, and this is uh, the point that's well made by the authors um, by explicitly expose model to high hierarchical structural text that should bring in a performance boost and by separate concerns between parsing lower level sequence and learning of higher level structure, we should also give the model an easier time to do summarization. But I also must provide a heads up for testing this paper. Structure information is not uh, learned from scratch, but provided through external processes, as you will later see how that's been done. Well, why, why using graph? And it's not hard to see that texts are naturally a graph. We, this is an example from the paper. You see we have next edge, in edge, reference edge. What that means in this context is these words are inside a sentence, and these one word could be right next to each other, and words can be co-referencing the same thing. So there's naturally a hierarchical structure and naturally this interconnection uh, making text um, a great um, kind of data set for um, being represented in a graph form. So on a high level, the architecture of this model um, is uh, compared to the standard sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, 
uh, we still have the per token representation token we can think about it as words and sequence as sentences and we still have these uh, this type of intermediate products uh, from a sequence to sequence model but we are adding a graph component right here so that is we can think about it as an encoding of the structural information and then in the end we are concatenating both the graph represent representation and the sequence representation together and send that into the standard decoder. And uh, here we are uh, having a zooming view of how exactly is a graph neural network being used. And there are different flavors of graph neural network. And the one that's been used in this paper is called gated graph neural network, and acronym GGNN, that will be repeatedly used in the later section of the paper. Gated means it uses GRU. Uh, why GRU? So think about the, the earlier example of uh, words right next to each other, words in sentences, sentence right next to each other. Uh, we ended up having a graph that could look like so. But if we pick any one of the graph, for example, we pick pick A, and we traverse and through the next no point, and we arrive at C, and we can expand its neighbors in a similar fashion. And then what it means is this kind of expanded structure. Each node becomes a computational graph, right? Okay, then the next thing we want to do is how do we embed this graph information so that we still preserve the structural um, info from the graph, but we would have an easier time to process this in a different dimension. And that's the idea of embedding the nodes. And there are, again, many different ways of doing this. And the one particular way chosen by the authors is uh, the neighborhood aggregation. So, for example, from any one of those uh, ex expanded uh, subgraphs, we can see, uh, oops. We can think about, okay, how do we uh, collect all of the information from the neighboring nodes and eventually uh, get, say, oh, what are the neighboring uh, information are telling me and what do I do for the next time step? Um, that, and going back to the earlier example of, we, we can also notice that that's one thing, we need to aggregate all of the information from the neighboring nodes. The other thing is we can see that any of those graphs can be several layers deep. And that involves, oh, we probably also need something that's a deep neural network. And um, the choice made by the authors is the gated neural network, which means we're probably traversing the graph by using RN modules. So each of these aggregation steps involves a, a GRU cell, hence the name gated, because you use the gated recurrent neural network. Okay. Um, here we go into some equations inside of the model, uh, inside of a paper. Um, the basic structure of the graph look like so. Um, we have, the nodes um, in this situation will be a collection of tokens and we have uh, from the sequence. And we also have the features associated with the nodes uh, that will be the token embeddings that uh, in this situation, it's the initial state of the node. Remember, we're doing this kind of propagation through our network and we need an initial state that will be the embedding of the token. And we have directed edges that, that, that's connecting nodes. And in the context of text summarization, that could be in next rough, as we have seen earlier. And this is a basic structure of the graph. And then uh, we need to do the neighborhood aggregation of collecting all the inf structural information from my, our neighbors. And that's how's that been done. Here comes the second equation. We have the current state of the neighboring node, and we have a edge type dependent function that, that in this situation is, um, is a linear layer. 
and we are at collecting all of the information from our neighbors and we apply a neighborhood aggregation in situation is element wise sum. Now we're carrying, okay, all of the messages from my neighbors and I have that information ready to make decisions about my next time step. And here comes the GRU part and here is the, for example, this is a current state of the target node we're looking at. And here is all of the neighborhood messages it has collected through equation two. And we, uh, and we use that as input uh, to the GRU and we transition to the next time step. This really is done to help us traverse from one node to uh, the next. And, and in the end, uh, we have our node uh, after traversing for a fixed time step t, uh, we have our node level representations. And the next slide will show how do we aggregate that further into a higher level graph level representations. Okay. Here is the step of the uh, part two. Um, this is the top most equation is showing the same thing as right here. Um, we have um, per element representations, we have edges, we have tokens, and we input that into our graph network and we get a node level representation. Now we need to aggregate that into a graph level representation. So this is done by putting that by by first inputting the um, node level representations into a fully connected layer. And we have another fully connected layer that has a sigmoid activation function. So this is a scalar that gives us the weight. And this is a vector that's the output of the fully connected layer. And we apply the weights to the output. We get a vector that's a graph level representations. So Yusan and Sarosh, Sarosh, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Um, well, so, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, so you're defining really great and continue with Sean, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what I remember we had uh, in an earlier discussion about the second equation, uh, the right. equation in the middle, um, uh, um, Sean um, uh, uh, pointed out that um, that uh, uh, the the left term, um, basically the um, this the sigmoid term, mm -hmm. um, seems to act um, kind of like a tension in this yes, context. Yes, I forgot to mention um, that. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now we have the graph level representation. We this we still have our sequence representation from the standard sequence encoder. Uh, we want to combine the two so that we can do our hybrid sequence graph representation, right? And the way it's done is concatenate both the sequence representation and the graph representation and throw that into a fully connected layer. And this kind of blending uh, operation give us the final hybrid representation that has both lower level information and also the higher level structural information. That's the basic idea of the sequence GNN. And uh, now let's look at how, how it performs. Um, does it really help? And in this paper, uh, we have several different tasks uh, that has different extent of inherent structure. And uh, there are also a comprehensive set of comparisons with other state of our sequence to sequence models. And we will see how the model perform and what we can take away from that. Here are the three tasks and the corresponding data sets that's been used for the three tasks. And um, two out of the three tasks are for source codes. The final one is a natural language summarization task that uses a classic CNN Daily Mail data set um, that has news article, uh, full, full, full length news articles, and also a concise story highlights as a target. Um, so we'll, for the two source codes, method naming and method doc, what are they? And um, for method naming, it's an extreme 
uh, summarization. What we're trying to do is given a group of source codes, how do we infer the names of the functions and methods from the source codes? That you can see that the output is usually a word or a phrase. Right, very short. And the method doc will be a little more verbose, but still pretty short. In that situation, we're trying to uh, come up with a doc string for the functions and methods. But both of these two tasks that are focusing on source codes have built-in structures, which we can think about as, as, oh, variables belong to functions or methods, and functions or methods belong to class or submodules, and some modules belong to module. Um, that's easy to construct, relatively speaking, versus natural language processing. Uh, we don't always have those tools handy, so we will see later that uh, the authors used some other external processes to help them build the graph to start with. And the data sets for the source codes are like so, uh, C Sharp and Java for yeah, NL, we already talked about C and Daily Mail data set. OK, now going into the model architecture and what kind of performance metrics are used to evaluate the model. Um, so uh, all these tests are, uh, you are using the same architecture for the sequence part of the encoder. We use a bidirectional LSTM with one layer and 256 hidden units. And there's no mentioning of using pre-trained embeddings. So we can safely assume that the initial embeddings are trained from scratch. And then for the gated GNNs, uh, we are using 128 hidden units are rolled over eight time steps. This is, for, again, for graph traversing. And for the decoder part, it's also one layer, but now it's by a unit direction because for decoder, we just have to go for from left to right. And then we also, uh, and we have two, also have 256 hidden units, um, but now we have attention. We also have, uh, have pointer network and copying mechanism. But one thing that's worth noticing is coverage mechanism that we um, talked about earlier is not using this paper, which will become a problem later on as we go through our results. And for metrics, um, the, the authors mostly want to uh, focus on root scores, uh, which is a uh, F1 score that's um, a geometric average of recall and recall and precision. And that's counting the overlapping portion of our predicted summary versus our target summary. And then, to, yeah, yeah, go for sorry it. Sorry to interrupt. I yeah. just want to add it's a harmonic mean of. Uh, uh, oh. of Precision Sorry, did recall? I say some me? <laughs> you, you said, I think you said geometric average. Um, My bad, but, that, but, yeah. but that's fine. <laughs> um, and I just want to also add, we, we did have a discussion on it um, earlier mm -hmm. on, um, Sean and I. And um, so I, I think, like, um, if you remember the, the the actual name, I think it's it's it started out with recall. Uh, nowadays, um, they do... Um, um, it's um, they do compute the recall precision and um, usually uh, the thing that people um, uh, like to see on the papers um, is the F score because mm. uh, and that's the, just one one um, uh, sort of one measure to uh, compare everything. Right. Uh, just want to say that, but I think it originally started from recall, as you pointed out um, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, everybody. It's it's harmonic me, harmonic me. Don't mess up like me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, but and you don't have to care too much about the details of it if you are not familiar with the root score. Uh, you only need to keep in mind that higher scores are viewed as better performances. This is not exactly true. Evaluation metrics are still an active area of research. And how exactly do we evaluate a good summary versus bad one? But we have to start from somewhere. And these are the commonly used ones. Okay, now we go into how exactly are the data presented. Um, and for the source code, it's uh, more straightforward. We are breaking up uh, the identifier tokens, which will be the variables, methods, classes, et cetera, into subtokens. And in any situation that we run into the camel case or Pascal case, when we have hybrid names, they're split up into subtokens. 
And then all of the information, the model are fed with all of the information of oh, what belongs to what, when is this method last used in, inside of a source code, et cetera. And you can naturally see that this translates into in token, next token, child token, child being method belongs to a class and so on. And, and, and when is this method last used inside of a source code? Um, so these are pretty straightforward versus for natural language summarization. Uh, it's the structure is really a lot weaker and the way the authors, uh, and, and the, the input that the authors use to build their graph is based on Stanford Core NLP. This provides number one, the tokenization tools for them. And number two, uh, it has named entities and co-referencing information that helps them to build the reference edge, for example. So this will also be somewhat problematic. This is great, a uh, great tool to help them build a graph to start with, but you can also see that um, if imagine the core NLP annotation is in any way imperfect or having any kind of noise or errors that will also be translated into, into the model itself. And now becomes the moment of truth. Um, let's see how the models perform. Um, hopefully everybody can see this table clearly. So every time if you see something that's highlighted by yellow, uh, that's the author's uh, model versus mm -hmm. the other ones or not, are the reference. So for all of this, uh, for the method naming, uh, section. Let's first look at the top panel. We can see that no matter which kind of architecture we're, we're referencing to, soft attention, soft attention, or by LSTM, LSTM, the moment we add a G, G and N augmentation, our score got a lot better, right? That's great news. That means having a graph and to help better understand the structure really, really helps for this task. And um, so number one conclusion, method naming, five-star performance, awesome. And <laughs> versus <laughs> versus for method doc, um, oh, most of the time it's great. Um, if we don't look at a self-attention part, we can see that, oh, um, anytime if, if we add GNN, we have a performance boost the most of the time. The only exception is for the self-attention, self-attention architecture. Uh, without using GNN, we actually have better score. Um, well, depends on what score you're looking at. Maybe blue isn't, is, is not a case, but for three out of four. Um, so the author has and authors have an explanation for that. They're saying, oh, this is probably because we only used 10 time steps to do the graph traversing. Had we done more, uh, it would have um, interpreted the structure better. But this is only one way of interpreting it. Um, so if, if you sound and Suresh have something to add, please feel free as to why. Um, yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, I guess uh, the way they tried to uh, define the task was based on different lengths of the output, actually. From mm -hmm. method naming, it's going to be one or only two, three words, something like this, not more than method doc, it's going to be a, mm. yeah, longer output. And the most of the, uh, the uh, longest one is going to uh, natural, natural language summarize it. Mm. I guess uh, we can, uh, somehow track the differences between different lengths of the output. Uh, I think it was a good uh, way of framing that uh, this model is still abstractive. It's performing better for uh, shorter kind of uh, outputs. But That's true, yeah. yeah. As long as the uh, kind of, uh, I guess, the lens of output going to increase, there is a difference between uh, maybe sometimes uh, it's be a, it can be a kind of matter of scaling and the uh, kind of rouge and the, the scale that we are using. They can be become problematic because it's kind of, uh, yeah, as you told before, mentioned before, it's kind of under review because it's not usually when the, uh, our reference output may not be the perfect one. And maybe we have something that works good and but the, scale cannot measure it as it's needed or well. yeah that's a good point remember that these metrics are not perfect themselves so yeah. don't be carried away too much by that 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, finally, as and Serge just mentioned, for natural language summarization is a much more challenging uh, task, even with the help of constructing graphs with core NLP. And uh, as we can see from the left hand side panel, the moment we add gene in, there's always some degradation to the performance. And especially when we compare the very last the one when we have pointer, we also have coverage. Um, it's it's really beaten by this particular architecture. I, I also personally find it unfortunate that the authors was were not able to have a chance of adding coverage. I, I think I'm pretty sure that could have helped. Uh, okay, now we have looked at these quantitative scores. They may or may not be perfect. They are not perfect. They may or may not be correct. And in terms of really evaluate uh, the quality of the summaries, let's really look at some of the examples. Number one example is method naming. Uh, the, here are two examples from C sharp codes. And you can see that here the, the function names are left a blank. And the ground truth is foo, uh, or ground truth equals, and the, uh, the GNN augmented encoder decoder uh, architecture were able to uh, return the correct answer. Awesome. And uh, the same thing happens to the example too. Um, the performance are pretty good. So and this this is exactly consistent with what we see in this table here. For yeah. method naming, gene it really is really helpful. Yeah. So I I'd, I'd like to add um, yeah. um, maybe a quick point about these scores. So sometimes um, two um, um, two systems can have a very similar or even identical um, F scores, um, mm. and, and Rouge F scores, um, and uh, but one could be uh, objectively much better than the other. That's that's yeah. very possible. So that's why mm. you you always um, want to see uh, um, uh, the um, qualitatively also mm -hmm. uh, what does the um, uh, the summary um, look like. Um, right. So and that's why it's very important to check these. And usually in, in the papers. Uh, um, it's provided much similar to GANs where uh, there are scores, but you always want to see the image. Right. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what we're doing here. And um, example number one, method naming. Uh, looks like we indeed have very good performance. Uh, let's go to the method doc um, task. Uh, here we see a different picture. Uh, example one is still pretty reasonable, and it's a lot shorter than the ground truth, but it's not making, I would say, fatal mistakes. But then for example two, we start to see the self-repetition problem that looks pretty severe. We see provider, provider. We see a keep down a repeating initialization on its own. So this is uh, my own comment. Um, if uh, the authors have had a chance of also including coverage, this might have been a different story. And uh, going to the third uh, task of natural language uh, summarization, here is an interesting example of seeing the power of using pointer. So we see that in this uh, um, in this particular example that I'm pointing at here, we have unknown tags. That's that's that means it's a rare words that that that's not even part of the embedding. But by using pointer, we can see that it's it's, it's really able to mitigate that, that problem because now we also have access to the source and text. Um, um, great example. So yeah. um, it's been. This is sorry to cut you up. Yeah. Um, this is to um, to Xiang, who's uh, uh, kindly streaming the videos. Uh, they seem to have a um, uh, yeah. The, this the slides seem to be stuck um, while streaming. Oh. Uh, they seem to be only seeing still only the performance comparison slide. Oh wow! Let me. Um, so it's um, worst case scenario uh, to pe to people online. Worst case mm -hmm. scenario. Um, after um, after uh, the streaming is done, um, uh, this is going to be fixed. You, you'll you'll see the the right progression of slides, uh, but bear with us until it's fixed. Okay, that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's unfortunate. It was uh, yeah. it was very interesting uh, to right. see the results. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Please please carry on. Yeah, I will have to proceed no matter what. So my apologies to those technical problems.
Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I'm just Wonderful. going to go ahead with the assumption of it's, it's been fixed right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe just, just to uh, uh, tease people a little bit, just show that the previous slide so that they have an idea of what we, what we talked about very quickly. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. So like after this one? The right, yes. right, right, right. Yeah, so anything after the comparison. Oh, okay. Program. Okay, so this is where we got stuck. Hopefully it's been fixed mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we are transitioning from quantitative evaluation of the performance into qualitative ones, meaning we are just not looking at the scores. We're also looking at the actual output and compare that with the input to have a better and better idea of how exactly, uh, how, how exactly is the performance of the model. And example number one is method naming. Uh, as we can see that uh, we have really good consistency between the GN augmented encoder decoder versus the branches equals equals and a pen switch or pen switch. Uh, this is very good for this task. And task number two is method doc. And now we already start to see the self-repetition problems as it's been highlighted right here. So uh, one takeaway is had the authors had a chance of including the coverage mechanisms into the decoder, which isn't mm -hmm. in the point paper, this would happen a different story. And then going to the most challenging task of natural language summarization, uh, we can see this ex particular example of how the pointer mechanism help mitigate of uh, rare and important words that are not part of the embedding. Once we also have the access to the source text itself, we're able to get rid of the unknown tag right here. But we will also see counter examples of severe self-repetition. So this is an example. Uh, even after using uh, pointer, we still have the decoder keep repeating itself in this highlight section can see firefighters and paramedics and so on and so on. Again, repeating firefighters, paramedics, and police. So this it's is interesting. a problem. Yeah. It's interesting to see that the pointer um got rid of the unknown token. Yeah, right, yeah. But I wish they had to use the coverage as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, this is um, um, the, the end of the results section. And now we go into conclusions, questions, and takeaways. So I will mix what uh, um, the author's conclusions was my own um, summaries and, and questions. And then I'll also ask Isan and Suj to add their yeah. So uh, I, I think yeah. we're running out of time. I think we're yeah. already three minutes over. Oh, um, whoops. Sorry. We have, uh, let's go through those uh, quickly and mm -hmm. uh, people can uh, leave comments and, and yeah. questions on um, on YouTube uh, mm -hmm. comments mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll try to answer those um, later. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let, let me just like, stick away the paper then. Um, the author's conclusions and pros and cons of including GN augmentation. Pros are pretty obvious by including uh, explicit relationship modeling. We can see that at least for the source code task, it provides a performance boost in a very obvious way. And uh, so this is a promising beginning of including graph representations into a traditional sequence to sequence kind of architecture for a uh, summarization tax. The cons are a uh, number one for the natural language summarization, it requires an, an external annotation that's provided by core NLP. So like what we talked about earlier, any errors that's already happened in core NLP will be translated into, into our our model as well. So that's one problem. The other is on computational costs. Graph are not cheap. It has a linear time with number of edges that we have to handle per propagation step. You can see that if we want to have um, even deeper graph traversing, the computational cost can grow rapidly. So that's another problem. But um, main takeaway is having having explicit exposure of structure uh, for the model is very helpful. And, and and I'll just end here. These are my own comments. Okay. Um, I I'd say it's let's let's go through your comments quickly oh, as well. Oh, okay. uh, people are on YouTube are asking. 
Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, as to my own notes and questions, um, I agree with the author's uh, comments about using the graph. Uh, from my own opinion, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's really helpful when there are straightforward ways to construct a graph, and less helpful if we have to construct a graph from external help, or we just have straight out have no easy way of constructing it in the first place. Um, so uh, this feels like either a luxury or overly feature engineering. And uh, as a lazy person myself, I really hope I don't have to do heavy handed structural annotations uh, before I have to use a deep neural network. And um, that's something to think about. Um, and for the natural language summarization, um, one thing that's in, caught my attention is the reason to use core NLP is to use the core reference core referencing functionality. If we revisit this results section, you can see that it, it, it only uses in edge and next edge and co-referencing. So in that sense, what if we can just get rid of the co-referencing and only use in edges and next edges that still preserves the hierarchical structure of the text without having to use core NLP annotation? That's another for improvements. What if we can just use the natural structure of the tokens and the sequence itself to mm -hmm. construct a graph? Uh, and just then, to add something yeah. quickly on that point yeah. is yeah. Uh, so um, often. Um, we we use some some text pre-processing. Um, mm -hmm. So like even even detecting sentences, um, it it may sound uh, trivial at first, but mm -hmm. um, Core NLP and and other uh, so Python's NLTK, um, mm -hmm. other packages um, are um, have established technology to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So even for that, you'd probably still have to tokenize your text. Mm -hmm. Text. Yeah. Tokenization is still preserved, but my thinking is maybe we don't have to use the referencing heavily. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. could be something. Yeah, this yeah. is me being naive, may not be right. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting because that's yeah. one of the important points that the paper is trying to make. It's yeah. interesting to see how much co-referencing actually helps. Right. Um, because uh, you would think that it would help with the uh, with the long distance um, dependencies. Right. So things that could have gotten forgotten, but we don't want them. Mm -hmm. to be forgotten. That's um, true. Yeah. yeah, but it will be interesting to see an actual test exactly. of having having co-referencing versus not having co-referencing. So yeah, that's just some thoughts. Exactly. Um, and the other is a uh, convolutional neural network is also inherently sensitive to hierarchical structures that could also be uh, an, an alternative way of providing explicit uh, structure uh, exposure to the model. Uh, and I believe there are uh, several videos on this subject but on ACE's website as well. So if uh, we want to have a follow-up discussion on this subject, that would be great too. And the, third, the fourth one really is, unfortunately, the authors didn't include coverage uh, in the decoder. And we have seen that it suffered from uh, self-repetition problems. And this really is a low-hanging fruit um, for <laughs> immediately improve their performance. And given given, yeah. given the architecture, do you still think it's uh, it's low? Because I haven't I haven't given it a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. um, but where would it actually uh, be implemented? Given that we were using both the graph and the RNNs, mm -hmm. um, I haven't really thought about it fully. Yeah. Um, not maybe that I have thought of as, Maybe it's not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's not as trivial as we think, but yeah. it will definitely help because it, al yeah. it always helps with the repetition because right. that's what it, what exactly it penalizes. Yeah. Um, and the authors mentioned that themselves. This is a quote from the model and from the paper. And they believe that the model would have profited from, mm -hmm. from coverage mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and more sophisticated optimization. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty much it. Thank you for everybody's time, and thank you for and uh, thank my two facilitators for helping yeah. me out. <laughs> Absolutely, Surush, do you have any comments? Oh, uh, I don't. I I, uh, I guess we just we were talking about this point before. Uh, uh, my idea is that if they were adding a, a kind of pre-trained uh, embed embedding mm. input it could be more uh, fit to how we naturally, the human, understand the languages. And yeah. it could uh, improve the overall performance of uh, the paper, because mm -hmm. at least uh, the, uh, 
uh, the graph neural network had a kind of uh, cheat sheet, something like this, that mm -hmm. these concepts are more close to each other, and I, I guess it could improve the in natural mm -hmm. language uh, task. Yeah. It's my yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say um, it's a very interesting point. I, may, maybe they uh, didn't uh, do it because of comparison pur purposes, because sometimes if you're comparing with something who didn't use pre-trained embeddings, uh, maybe you want to stay fair, but I'm guessing. Mm. That's a good point. Um, using pre-trained embedding, taking advantage of transfer learning should have helped. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's my comment and nothing yeah. more. <laughs> okay, that's good. Well, Sarush has uh, helped uh, form this pre presentation, um, uh, has helped uh, Shan um, along. Um, so, uh, Shan and Sarush, phenomenal job on this presentation. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, the work that you've already done at Arga Intellect as research associates, um, and hope to see you guys in another session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye.